We're in the studio of Fanwood artist Alan Schaefer. Mr. Schaefer has graciously agreed to paint the portrait of our legendary hometown heroine, Aunt Betty Frazee. There is no known existing record or image of how Elizabeth Lee Frazee looked in her lifetime, so we turn to the master artist's imagination, his canvas, and his palette of colors. If you're from this corner of Union County, chances are you've heard of Aunt Betty Frazee, the courageous young baker who served the needs of her rural farm community over 200 years ago, when the original 13 colonies strung like a ribbon along the eastern seaboard were determined to free themselves from British rule. Gershom, Betty's husband, was a builder of barns and houses and a master cabinet maker. Many examples of his craftsmanship survive to this day and are prized collector's items. Betty and Gershom had no children of their own, but had many nephews and nieces. Throughout her long life, Elizabeth was addressed by family and friends affectionately as Aunt Betty. Now we'll gather Aunt Betty from her time. We're traveling along Lampert's Mill Road. That's Raritan Road up ahead. We'll turn there and visit some of the beautifully restored homes that date back to the 18th century. That's the DeCamp House coming up on the right. It's a gem of farmhouse Georgian architecture, kept in a miraculous state of preservation. Like many buildings of the era, the house is composed of two structures joined together. The older part was built by John DeCamp in 1735. That's the year Paul Revere was born. The DeCamp farm property was a sizable area of grazing and tillable land but it was small in comparison to the sprawling plantations that dominated the landscape nearer to old Elizabeth Town, now called Elizabeth. To grasp the breadth of the DeCamp acreage, consider the family cemetery. It still exists and it's near a quarter of a mile from the house the plot is on Lampert's Mill Road on the corner property of 2160 Buttonwood Lane. The original gravestones are still standing. Here is the final resting place of John, Deborah, Dr. Gideon, Freelove, and Morris de Camp. During the Revolutionary War, Morris de Camp fought in Colonel Sheldon's Light Dragoons. A Freelove de Camp Dunham died in 1758, at the age of 26, she was mourned by the entire community. Aunt Betty surely attended her funeral. Betty lived to the ripe old age of 77. Continuing down Raritan beyond the DeCamp homestead on the right is the structure of what was the gristmill of the Lampert family. It has since been converted into a well-kept private residence. The water wheel is long gone, but the mill pond is still on Shackamax and Golf Course. The old mill race can be traced to it from behind the house. It was here that the farmers of the 18th and 19th centuries brought their grain to be milled. Aunt Betty's bread was made from flour ground at the Lambert Mill. A prolific baker, Betty kept four barrels of flour and three dough troughs on hand to keep her oven busy. 
Just up the rise from the mill sits the beautifully restored original Lampert homestead. It too is a merger of several houses. The original structure dates back to the pre-revolutionary era. It was here after the battle with the Continentals at Ash Swamp in June 1777 that one of two columns of redcoats under the command of Lord Cornwallis encamped for the night in the area of the Lampert Farm. Behind the house was the Lampert Cider Mill and Distillery. It was famous for its notorious Applejack brandy that the Lamperts distilled from hard cider. The settlers called it Jersey Lightning. One of the hottest days on record had drawn to a close and not a few of the dehydrated British soldiers helped themselves to the potent brew. Several died during the revel, gone berserk from excessive drink and the oppressive heat. Next morning, the spiteful redcoats seized James Lambert, the founder of the distillery, and continued their advance toward Westfield. They joined with Howe's column and returned to Staten Island, a British stronghold. Lambert was summarily moved to the infamous Sugar House Prison in Lower Manhattan, where he died several months later. A portion of the ill-famed jail, bars and all, can be seen near Police Plaza across from City Hall. Across from the Lampert House is the Littell Homestead, circa 1720. This beautifully restored home stands proudly on the corner of Raritan Road and Lake Avenue, known in Aunt Betty's time as the Quaker Road to Rahway. John Littell was the proprietor of a neighborhood tavern on the corner of Raritan and Martin. The tavern, like most homes along their path, was plundered by the Redcoat Horde in their advance toward Westfield after the battle. Littell's Tavern was a regular stop for the Swift Shore Stagecoach Line. It was a favorite gathering place for settlers of the colonial period. Aunt Betty, who lived a scant mile up the road, could count on getting the latest reports on the hostilities from patrons of Littell's establishment. The location had been occupied by public houses and inns from the 18th century until the management of the Center for Hope purchased the property several years ago and converted it into office space. On behind the Center for Hope are the fringes of Ash Swamp. The area is an undeveloped county park and the location of what was in the colonial period one of the larger Lenape settlements of the region. Ahead is the location of the Lenape settlement. It's called Red Hill. Actually, it's more of a rise than a hill. The name comes from the reddish soil that contains glacial rock that is exceptional materials for making arrowheads and utensils. This is an aerial view of the site. A trail often used by youthful motorbike riders completely encircles Red Hill. The intersection of Raritan and Martine is shown at the top. Raritan runs down on the left and the Union County Technical Schools are at the lower level. The Lenapes, which translates as original people in their language, were small, self-sufficient groups that had no tribal structure or powerful chiefs. There were estimates that roughly 8,000 Lenapes lived in pre-settlement New Jersey. In this region, there are no descendants of these proud original people. They can be found to this day in Ohio, Kansas, and Oklahoma. The tribes were only area for thousands of years before the arrival of the settlers from Elizabethtown and Rahway. We're back heading south on Raritan and approaching on our right is the Sayers Littell Homestead, which dates to 1750 and hosts the halfway house and well. The cool, fresh water refreshed many a traveler from Plainfield to Rahway. The well was just about halfway between the two rural communities. On the left are the Union County Technical Schools, site of the old Frazee Lee Homestead and Farm. In the 1960s, the house was moved to 11 Black Birch to make room for the schools. Thank you. 
the center section was the original structure built in 1764 by Moses Frazee, Aunt Betty's brother-in-law. The homestead of Thomas Lee was added in 1828. It's a beautifully kept house and an ideal representation of a farmhouse of Aunt Betty's time. Aunt Betty was a Lee, born in Rawway in 1738. There were Lees and Frazees aplenty in these parts back in those days. In the 1930s, digging to install gas lines along Raritan Road, belt buckles and buttons were unearthed that identified the remains of Hessian soldiers, mercenaries in Cornwallis' massive army. It was so hot that sweltering day in June of 1777 that several died of heat stroke. They were hastily buried in shallow graves along the line of march. Here, where Terrell Road and Raritan can join, was known as two bridges in Aunt Betty's time. This photo of the Frisee House was taken in the 1870s and gives us a good idea of how Aunt Betty's homestead appeared in her time. As you can see, Raritan Road was little more than an earthen country lane winding its way through sprawling farmlands. If quaint by modern standards, the road was a vital thoroughfare for the settlers in the area. It is here that Betty Frazee's house still stands. In the early part of the last century, the house and tract of land was owned by the Rhino family. Frank and Louise Terry bought the property in the 40s and developed the Terry Lou Acre Zoo. It was a landmark for 45 years until it closed a while back. They claimed it was the largest privately owned zoo in New Jersey. The old Frazee house is a familiar sight to folks around town. We could only wonder what Aunt Betty would think if she saw the condition of the home she lived in for nearly 60 years. Deceive me. Look at the old place. It's gone to rack and ruin. The barn is gone along with the wagon shed. And what of the joiner's shop? My beehive oven. Gone but for the brick partition. A pity. I baked many a loaf in that oven. Not the least of which was requested by a pair of King George's highest ranking officers. A pair of popinjays were in command of a horde of pillaging lobsterbacks advancing towards the West Fields after the battle along Ash Swamp. The West Fields was how Westfield was referred to in the 18th century, as with our town, the Scotch Plains. Both were bordering areas of Greater Elizabethtown, which at that time made up most of what is now Union County. The Short Hills in the Scotch Plains area may be confused with the town of Short Hills, 10 miles to the north. The Short Hills at Ash Swamp, where the battle took place, are a series of low geological formations that are common to our area. Just prior to the battle, General Washington was staying at his headquarters here at Deacon Drake's house on Front Street in Plainfield. 
Upon learning of the British advance from Perth Amboy, he and his subordinates moved up to the mountain overlook near the encampment of the main body of his troops. Washington held a high ground and the redcoats were intent on breaking through the gap in the mountain and attacking the Continentals from behind. It was from this vantage point that General Washington observed the progress of the battle. From here, he could see Perth Amboy to the east and Brunswick and the heights of Princeton and Trenton to the south. In colonial times, the land was cleared for farming and grazing, allowing Washington an approximate view of the troop movements. It was this factor that allowed the sound of the battle, especially the British heavy cannon, to be heard 20 miles away in Lower Manhattan. It was late June, and it was sure to be another hot day, so I fired up my oven in the cool of the morning and began baking bread for the Continentals encamped near Ash Swamp. I could hear nearby cannon fire throughout the morning. It was enough to send most of the area's families west to the mountains to be near the protection of General Washington's army, but I stayed at the oven knowing the bread was needed for the sustenance of our troops. It was past the noon hour when I heard the sound of drums, an unfamiliar tattoo coming from up toward Dog Corners. Dog Corners? But in Aunt Betty's time, there was a dog farm near the corner of Raritan Road and Rawway Road. The canine compound has been gone for nearly 200 years, but the name stuck. Ask an old timer, he'll direct you to Dog Corners. the hearth and ventured towards the road. Then along past the apple orchard appeared a pair of horses, each bearing a nobleman of high rank. I was soon to learn that one was his lordship Sir William Howe himself, the highest ranking British officer in the colonies. A Viscount he was, and a descendant of King George I. With him was his compatriot Lord Charles Cornwallis. The King's generals were leading an army of redcoats, 10,000 strong, who marched along sweating like jackbooted swine in the broiling sun. I'd not seen that many Englishmen at one time in all my 39 years. The line stretched back as far as the eye could see. I scurried back to my kitchen as Lord Cornwallis called a halt to the troops. A pair of noblemen dismounted. Up past the well they strutted with their gold buttons and epaulets gleaming in the afternoon sun. In a thrice I'm standing face to face with their lordships. Cornwallis, oh and he was a statesman he was, bows and clears his throat announcing that he could not help catching the appetizing odors coming from my oven. May it please my lady, he asks, to give one of the king's generals the very next loaf that comes from your oven of baking bread? Soon the bread was ready, and I uneasily complied with the general's request. But, as I offered the steaming loaf, I said, Your lordship will please understand that I give you this bread in fear, and not in love. To my astonishment, he bowed and announced, Then, my lady, Neither I nor any man in my command shall accept a single loaf. The officers returned to their mounts and gave the order to advance towards the west fields. At least Cornwallis was a gentleman, which is more than I can say for the scarlet horde of pillagers he commanded. For no sooner were the generals out of sight, they availed themselves of nearly everything on the property. Three cows, 23 sheep, the contents of Gershom's joiner's shop, half of our household goods, even the picket fence. It took hours for the column to pass by the farm. 
On by they paraded like row upon row of crimson clothespins. Twas near nightfall when the sound of their drums faded on up past the Lee homestead. But the odor of gunpowder lingered until dawn. The next time you drive by the entrance to the Ashbrook Golf Course on Raritan Road here on the south side of Scotch Plains, stop and visit the familiar monument to the Battle of the Short Hills. It offers descriptions of the battle, maps, and listings of the patriots who fought in the encounter. That cannon mounted on the top is an excellent replica of an American eight-pounder. Down the road from the Battle Monument is the historic Terry Well. You'll find it on Rawway Road at the corner of Cooper Road. On that scorching afternoon, the parched British troopers drank that well dry. Wearing those wool uniforms surely intensified their discomfort. After the battle, Young John Littell found a discarded red coat jacket, and with the conclusion of the hostilities, he used it as a scarecrow in his cornfield. It was said that it stood there intact for over 70 years. Now, the Brits may have lost the war, but they sure could make a durable uniform. The beautifully restored Stage House Inn stands on Park Avenue at the center of town in the north side of Scotch Plains. John Sutton built the primary structure in 1737, the year before Betty was born. It was another stop on the Swift Shore Stagecoach Line. Marquis de Lafayette tarried here when General Washington was at Camp Middlebrook in the Wachungs. Back in the 1950s, the renowned artist Maxwell Stewart Simpson was contracted to paint a mural of the historic confrontation between Betty and the generals. The next time you enjoy a delicious dinner in this superb restaurant, pause in the lobby and examine Simpson's often witty rendition of the celebrated event. Across the street from the inn is the Osborne Cannonball House which is the headquarters of the Historical Society of Fanwood Scotch Plains. The structure was built when Aunt Betty was yet in her 20s. In a skirmish during the war, the house was hit by a British 12-pounder. The ball crashed into the house and became lodged between the outer walls. The Osbournes took the incident in patriotic stride. They calmly patched up the home, and had little interest in retrieving the errant missile. 140 years later, in the early 1920s, a construction crew was working in the cellar. While shoring up one of the outer walls, the cannonball was dislodged and rolled unceremoniously onto the cellar floor. Aunt Betty has one more stop to make, the Westfield Presbyterian Church. In her time, it was a simple wooden structure. The day after the battle, the Redcoats under Howe's command turned the meeting house into a scene of bloody desecration. They slaughtered plundered livestock in the sanctuary and placed a ram's head on a pulpit. Then they threw down the bell from the belfry and carted it off with them on their return to Staten Island. William Clark, a man from the Westfields, was being held in the Sugar House prison and heard the familiar sound of the bell in the distance. After the war, he reported his discovery and the bell was joyfully returned to the meeting house.
This beautifully maintained cemetery is the final resting place for many patriots of Betty's time. It is hallowed ground. Betty visited Gershom's grave for over 24 years. Then, in January 1815, word spread quickly among the residents. Not only of the news that the American forces had defeated the British at the Battle of New Orleans at the close of the War of 1812, but that a revered figure had passed away. Aunt Betty, a unique historical icon of our community, had gone to rest next to her beloved Gershom. Sleep well, Elizabeth Lee Frazee.
The Fanwood Scotch Plains Rotary Club is resolved to resurrect the historic Frazee House and make it a focus of 18th century memorabilia and demonstrations of daily life in Aunt Betty's time. It will be open to public meetings, arts and craft shows, and community events. The surrounding property will be a passive park with plenty of space for picnics and township gatherings. Eventually, the barn, carpenter shop, and other outbuildings will be added. In time, the Frazee property will become a working farm again. How wonderful it will be to once again taste vegetables grown from Frazee soil.